my wife, Patricia Sweet, I'm Howard, and uh, she's going to talk a little about um, Jennifer and um, get this started. Yeah, and then Howard, you want to open us up in prayer first? Okay. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, please bless us with your Holy Spirit. Mm. Lord, please fill each one of us, including those that will be listening on YouTube with understanding of the great teacher and lord please anoint jennifer that she is filled with the holy spirit and was able to convey as the holy spirit would have her tell her story lord we ask this in jesus name amen yeah, thank you yeah we're very excited um to have one of our own jennifer foster is also an fgb mfi phoenix chapter uh, and member, and she has a, a really interesting um, testimony that uh, we're hoping that she'll um, bless us with, um, you know, some of her testimony. Um, she is uh, a co-host of Blazing the Trail broadcast, and she is from Jacksonville, Florida, so we're happy to have her. She's also a, she has a, a talent for singing. She's a psalmist and she's a songwriter and we're hoping she blesses us with the song. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that um, it, once you hear her sing, um, it again, truly a blessing. Um, and her testimony of how she grew up with adversity and overcame uh, what she had to go through in her childhood to find salvation and to use her gifts of for the kingdom. Uh, it's just a, a riveting story and we're so proud of her and her accomplishments and we know she's going to go far with her ministry and again we're, we're really happy to have her share tonight. So go ahead Jennifer. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. So um, let's see, where do we begin? Okay, so um, I grew up in Costa Rica. My mom and dad met actually in um, Bible college and um, they were, you know, in their in their early twenties. Um, my mom and my dad actually um, married um, because my mom had become a convert, and she had decided to join Bible school instead of working full time. So when my grandmother found out that my mother was no longer going to be uh, contributing to the household, um, she began mistreating my mom. Um, she would just uh, throw plates of food across the table. And if my mom cut the plate, she would eat. If she didn't catch the plate, she wouldn't eat that day. And because uh, she was no longer contributing to the household, everybody just started kind of looking at her sideways. And um, she didn't have a way out. So her and my dad were just friends. They were not even dating or anything, but he proposed to her and she said yes. So they were married. Uh, and about a year and a half later, they had me. And a year and a half later after that, they had my sister. See, but my, my parents were, um, they were Baptist um, Bible school students. And the pastor that they worked for, that they were in alignment with, did not allow them to work outside of the Bible school. So he would pay them a salary, but the salary was so small and so little that they couldn't even afford to buy meat. So basically they had to live on a vegetarian diet and they had to ride the bus um, every day all day long all over the city they would have just barely enough money for the bus fare and if they wanted to eat something at the market or if they wanted to do something fun then they would have to walk home uh, several kilometers because everything was so far away and so uh, my mom tells me that when she was pregnant with me they were so poor that during Christmas, um, she would walk by the market and she would just be longing for uh, a little red apple or some fruit. And she would not say anything to my dad because she knew that my dad didn't have the money to even buy her that. So that many times she would just cry herself to sleep out of hunger, uh, being pregnant. And you can only imagine how difficult uh, that is when you're pregnant, you're hungry constantly and knowing that you can't get food. It's just really a desperate situation. 
So after my mom had me, a year and a half later, um, my sister came. And then um, when my sister was just a few months, um, the pastor of the Baptist church decided that he wanted to open up a new ministry in Guatemala. And he was looking for a couple who would be willing to go to Guatemala as missionaries. So he approached my mom and dad, and because my mom and dad were in such a dire need financially, uh, they went ahead and said yes. So we moved to Guatemala um, with basically just the clothes on our back and a couple of suitcases. However, because Guatemala was such a poor, poor country, even more poor than Costa Rica, um, and the pastor was supporting us financially in dollars, when we got to Guatemala, we were very prosperous. We had a lot of money. Uh, we had a private tutors. We had nannies. We were able to go to um, private school. My dad had a BMW, and then on top of that, he had a motorcycle. We had a whole farm with a bunch of animals. We had a cleaning lady, and everything was wonderful as far as that goes. Um, however, because my parents had been taught um, and trained in a, uh, in a Baptist theological seminary, they never received any type of training to deal with spiritual warfare, to deal with spiritual strongholds, to pray. They were not filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't speak in tongues. They didn't operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And Guatemala was very, 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 very hard ground. Uh, the pastors, they would go as missionaries to Guatemala, most of them were spirit-filled, and they did great. They had a lot of wonderful things happening for them because they had the Holy Spirit in them, and they could operate. They could cast out devils. They could do all these things, so those churches would thrive. But my parents' church was very traditional, and they didn't know how to do warfare in the spirit. So during one, um, one of the vacations that they would take periodically to go and and go back to Costa Rica and kind of give their testimony and share to raise funds again for the ministry. During one of those little vacations they took, they left an American missionary in charge of the church. And the church had finally started to grow a little bit and it was doing well. But the missionary had an orphanage with indigenous children. And the indigenous people didn't understand that when he was taking children off the street, he was actually providing them a home. They thought that he was kidnapping children. So they began to spread rumors that he was a kidnapper and he was taking kids and people better hide their children. And as a result, my mom and dad's church collapsed. Uh, the membership went down to basically nothing and they had to start from scratch. So my parents were so disheartened to have to start over. Uh, and my dad uh, started trying to look for a way to make things happen on his own. So he began selling cars and doing little things on the side. And he saw that that was more profitable than ministry as he felt it. And so he just continued to uh, bring the money in every month, but he was not doing any ministry at all. So he was using the money from the ministry for himself, but he was not preaching the gospel. He did not have a church. He did not have any of those things going on. He was basically just selling cars and doing his own thing on the side. And my mom, um, I remember being little, I could hear them argue all the time, and I didn't know what it was about, but this was the issue for why they were arguing. And finally, my mom just got so tired of it, she didn't want to have any part to do with it anymore. And um, she had a lot of health issues also. She had several herniated discs. And she had many issues because of that. They caused her a lot of pain. She had a, a really hard time walking, really hard time standing. She couldn't sit for long periods of time. And she was in constant pain. So she decided to go to Costa Rica and see a specialist. And while she was in Costa Rica seeing a specialist, my dad began to basically try to brainwash us and tell us that my mother didn't want to be with us anymore, that she didn't want to be our mom anymore, that she had basically just abandoned us, that she didn't care for us anymore. And uh, we began to believe those things because we didn't know any better. We were just small kids at the time. Um, I was about six and a half, and my sister would have been about 
four and a half, almost five. So we were pretty small. And I just remember feeling so abandoned. And it was only about a month and a half that we were with my dad. But um, we finally uh, were able to get our plane tickets and everything. And then we flew back to Costa Rica to be reunited with my mother. And then after that, I remember that the divorce was finalized. And uh, my parents uh, ended up separating. So when the pastor of the church found out what had happened and that my mom had left my father, um, rather than him supporting her and telling her that she had done the, the right thing, um, he shunned her. Uh, the whole church shunned her and she was seen as a basically an outcast because she was now a, a divorced woman. So um, I remember um, that one, <laughs> one Christmas after my, my parents had divorced, we were staying with a, uh, a relative of ours and someone came over and they brought over all these beautiful gifts and all these wonderful things for my cousin, but there was nothing for us. Um, because we were not related to the other people. And it just, it hurt so much because there was a lot of favoritism in the family. Um, I was a very quiet child. I was an extreme introvert. And being from a Latin background, we are loud and boisterous and animated. And, you know, we're Latinos. <laughs> that's the way that we do everything. We do everything really big and really loud. And that just was not me. That's something that I always tried to fit into, but it just, it didn't click with me for some reason. I just couldn't, um, I couldn't fake it till I made it kind of thing. But, um, so I just kind of stayed in the background and uh, if I was wanted, I would come around. If I wasn't wanted, I would stay quiet and just keep to myself in the corner. And I started experiencing a lot of depression and childhood depression. And I didn't know what it was at the time, but I look back on it now and I, and I know that's what it was. I had a lot of depression. I had a lot of uh, self-hatred because I couldn't understand why uh, my parents weren't together anymore. And so after my parents divorced, um, I thought that my dad would come around and see us every once in a while, but he did not. And on top of that, he refused to pay child support. So every six months or so, my mother would threaten him with throwing him in jail, and then he would pay up everything he owed. And then that's the only way she could get him to pay. So in the meantime, while my dad wasn't paying, we would live with relatives for three to five months. And whenever they got tired of us because we were kids, we were too loud, or we, they just didn't want us around anymore, uh, they started looking at us ugly. They didn't want to really take care of us anymore. Everything was a burden. Then we would move on to the next house. And then we would stay there for as long as they could tolerate us. And when we could see <laughs> that they could no longer tolerate us, then we would move to the other house. And then there was an aunt that I had that owned a convenience store. So compared to us, she had a lot of money. She had a lot of resources and she was very well off. And she offered my mom uh, a job as her maid if she would start taking care of the house and my mom said yes um, so my mom began to clean the house my mom began to iron for her to wash for her to do all these things for her because she was busy all day taking care of the supermarket and then at the end of the day um, she wouldn't give my mom any payment what she would do is that she would go through the vegetable section and then she would look at all the vegetables and all the fruit that were starting to go bad. Some of it had mold in it. Some of it already had uh, maggots growing out of it. And she would basically just give my mom a bag of rotten vegetables as payment. And then my mom would just take that food home. She would cut off all the rotten pieces and all the bad parts. And then she would make us a meal out of that. So um, that went on for, for some time. And then my mom uh, was finally able to land a job cleaning churches. So she would clean the church on Saturday and then she would take my sister and I to help her because her back would hurt so bad. So for whatever chairs, my sister and I were able to help her clean or whatever floors, she would give us a couple quarters and we would save that money up 
And then when Mother's Day would come around, we would turn around and give it right back to her for Mother's Day presents or Christmas presents or for whatever we could find because we didn't have an allowance or any kind of income. So um, I believe it was 1993, um, there was a audition at my school and they were looking for kids they would sing that you know could sort of carry a tune so I went ahead and I auditioned and then I went and I got accepted into the choir but my my music teacher took special interest in me so he started training me vocally and he taught me uh, a song that only him and I knew and he had made that song especially for me. So I competed with that song for regionals and I won first place. And um, that basically was the beginning of the Lord beginning to, to open up for me the area of singing. So now I had something to offer where before um, I wasn't wanted, I wasn't needed, I, I wasn't really thought at uh, as something that was important. But if there was a party or there was something going on in our family, they wanted me to perform and sing. And that was all that I was good for, performing and singing. And when I was done singing, they were just, okay, go, go with it, go with it. And then that was it. So um, I guess that began to shape my identity, that I had to perform in order to be accepted. So I remember any time people would not like me, I would try to find a way to make them happy. I would analyze myself to death, trying to figure out what is wrong with me, what do people not like me, what do people not accept me, my dad didn't like me either, my dad didn't accept me either, therefore there must be something wrong with me. And then um, I finally got to, to meet my, my grandmother on my dad's side um, at a church service that we went to in 1994, I believe it was. And I remember everybody was, was singing and everybody was having a good time during the service. And we decided to go over there and sit with her. And she was holding a hymnal. And then when she saw that we came close to her, she literally did this, the whole service. And she looked at the wall just so she would not have to look at us. And I remember my little sister trying to pull down the book so she could read what she was singing. And she refused. To look at us because she was so angry that my mom had left her son so we told my mom and, and she was really really angry she was really furious um and then she decided that she wanted to to do something better for us so she began calling around and trying to figure out what to do as far as housing and then she got in touch with someone that she had known when she was a teenager, when she lived in, in the city where, where we had moved to. And they told her there was a house for rent and that if she would be interested in it, she, she could have it for basically, I would say it would be like 50 to hundred dollars a month. So we were really excited that we would get to have our own house. And my mom had actually lived in that house when she was a teenager. And when she was a teenager, the house was already very, very old. So by the time my sister and I were kids, that house was well over 100 years. And it was not a house like what we have here in the States. It's not, it was not well built. It was not well insulated. Uh, when we went to go see it, the house was in such a bad shape that there were literally holes um, in the ceiling. Um, it had the, the sheets of metal they were literally detached and when the wind would blow they would like slap against each other and make all these creaking crunching horrible sounds <laughs> it was like something made out of a horror movie and then the house was just full of fleas so much so that we had to bomb at least probably 10 times just so we could sleep in the house because it was so bad and so full of bugs and so my mom paid the deposit and we moved in and we finally had a house to call our own. And even though the house was horrible and was in terrible shape, it felt like a castle to us because we no longer had to look down at anyone. We no longer had to ask people for permission to get something out of the refrigerator. We no longer had to um, beg anybody to, to let us watch TV or anything. We, we had a little tiny color TV. We had three, four channels. We had food in the refrigerator. 
um, when my mom would cook, we had a giant wood stove. She would make tamales and then she would sell them to the neighbors. And then we would make a little bit of extra money. So whenever she would do that, then we would be able to go out and do nice things like have ice cream or whatever. But um, I remember at night that we had to board up the walls because uh, not the walls, but the doors. The house was like a tri-level house. So you went into that house through the main street. And then you went down a, a couple of uh, stairs into the kitchen. And then there was a yard farther down. And then there was a couple of stairs going up to two different sides of the house. And those rooms were so badly and so in such a bad shape that there were literally holes on the floors. And then you couldn't go inside the room because you would fall through the floor and go and fall into the kitchen. And then we had a huge uh, wood pile to cook with. So we would have to board up the, the second door to, to the kitchen downstairs because on the bottom, um, there was this really, really, really big rat that lived under our stairs. Um, everything was dirt floor under the stairs. So um, they were like huge sewer rats from New York and they would just run wild. Sometimes you would be, watching TV or you would go down to to get something you could just see the rest running through and then hiding into the wood pile and they had these giant roaches and they would just crawl towards you and, and you couldn't kill them because they were so big you couldn't even step on them and then every now and then they would have like we would have these big uh, I guess crawfish and scorpions come out from underneath the stairs so it's a house that would clearly be condemned here in the U.S., but it was the only place that we had to live. So we were happy in the house for a while, and then um, drugs started getting really, really bad in our neighborhood. And our landlord decided that he would go ahead and rent out a, an apartment to a guy that was kind of sketchy. Well, that guy ended up bringing all kinds of crackheads and prostitutes and people like that and where my sister and I could flee and you know go and freely play in the backyard before and we had a, a big doll house which we could play in they ended up taking over the drug the uh doll house and selling drugs out of it and running prostitutes out of it so we could no longer go outside and then on top of that our septic tank filled to the top and it started overflowing all over our yard so we had uh gray water black water uh, sewage running through our backyard. We had pimps, prostitutes, drug dealers, people doing crack in the middle of the day outside in our yard and literally um, all kinds of terrible things going on. We had a next door neighbor. Um, they had moved in a few months um, before that started happening and she had two teenage girls. Um, they were close to my age. One was a little bit older than me. The other one was about my sister's age. Well, we started noticing that the older girl uh, started wearing a lot of makeup. She started wearing high heels and um, she started hanging out with older men. So <laughs> it seems that her mom was prostituting her for money. And she was maybe 14. I was 12 maybe at the time, 12 and a half, so almost 13. And this girl would go out with men and uh, she would be all dressed up and everybody knew she was young, but nobody would say anything. And those men would just take her to bars and take her to places and we would see her come back really late at night. Um, and um, we didn't understand what was going on, um, but we do now. And so um, these crackheads and these prostitutes and these people, as uh, they were living in the backyard, they took a liking to my mom and my grandmother by the grace of God. I don't really know what it was, but they liked my mom and they loved my grandmother. And my grandma was the one that lived with us while my mom was at work. So every day we would have to walk to school alone. And the pimps, the crackheads, and the prostitutes would stand on the corners to make sure that we got home safe. And it's only by the grace of God that they didn't kidnap us and throw us in a car and rape us or sell us for organs or whatever, because that's not unheard of in Latin America, especially uh, at that time in the 90s, you know, and we had known of girls that would just would be walking around in the park and then this big group of guys would just gather around them and people would just walk by because they knew they were getting gang raped. 
and nobody would say nothing, nobody would do nothing. They would just cover it up, walk away like nothing happened. So it was just um, really, really, really terrible uh, things that we would see happening on on the regular basis. But these things were were normal for us to see because it was so prevalent that even as a kid, you knew you couldn't go certain places, you knew you shouldn't be with certain people, and you knew you had to avoid certain parts of towns at certain hours. And uh, there was also a lot of witchcraft in my in my city. My city is called it's Escazú, uh, Costa Rica, and San Jose, and it's known as the city of witches. So there's a lot of black magic. There's a lot of things going on, and I believe that all those things going on in the spirit only um, contributed to the darkness in the region. So anyway, as time progressed, and, and my mom began to see that she did not want pimps and crackheads and prostitutes walking us home and watching out for us even though she appreciated that they wouldn't hurt us she thought that we were getting older we were no longer little girls uh we were beginning to turn into teenagers so she became concerned and so one day she was just um, browsing a newspaper and then she came across this ad for uh correspondence dating meet an american in the u.s and all this stuff so she thought well why not if things don't work out he's there i'm here it's safe you know nothing's gonna happen so she began uh corresponding back and forth with a man and he had a little girl but he he wasn't really her type and they didn't have a whole lot of things in common so she stopped talking to him but then a few days later she found another ad for another man who was in his early 40s he had three kids uh, he lived in Oroville, California, and he said he was a Christian. He went to uh, Calvary Chapel, and he worked at a college. So she thought, wow, this, you know, he seems like a, like a decent guy. Let's, let's talk and see what happens. So they began talking, and, and uh, they bonded very quickly, uh, and they began to fall in love. So he came out to meet my mom, and um, I want to say it was, December of 1990, no, it would have been like January of 1994, and uh, he saw her in person, and he wanted to marry her right away, um, and everything, he was just ready to seal the deal, so my mom thought about it, and, and she did have feelings for him, and that she also wanted us to have a better future, so she said yes, and um, on the second time he came out, they went ahead and they got married at the court in Costa Rica. And then he got all our paperwork going. And I, I want to say probably around September or October of 1995, we got our papers back from immigration. Then we flew to California and we were able to go and live with them. So uh, when we got to California, we were really excited. Things were going to be wonderful. We were finally going to have a dad, and we were going to live in a nice house. We were not going to have to deal with any more poverty. Uh, our house wasn't going to have holes or bugs or anything. We were going to learn English. We were going to be professionals and go to university, and, and so we thought. Um, turns out that he did work at, at a university. Uh, he was bus driver. <laughs> He was not a professor, like he had led my mom to believe that he was. Um, he was in an extreme amount of debt uh, because his kids were in and out of juvenile hall all the time. So within the first week, two weeks that we were there, uh, his oldest son got arrested for shoplifting while we were with him. Um, all of us kids went to the store to buy candy, and before we knew it, we were in handcuffs, and we didn't know why. Well, he had stole a bunch of stuff from the store and they had blamed all of us for it. So we all got into a lot of trouble and got blamed for a lot of things that he was doing. And then finally it got to where it was so bad that they locked him up and they put him in juvenile hall. And within the first three days, he broke every single rule that they had set for him in juvenile hall. And so he stayed in there uh, from the time he was um, 14 until he later on uh, had his 18th birthday. They finally let him out. So he stayed in there for a long, long time. But in the meantime, um, my stepsisters were um, extremely vicious uh, towards my sister and I. My stepdad, he would not listen. Uh, 
they could do no wrong in his eyes. And my sister and I were very naive. We didn't hardly even speak English at first. It took us three years just to learn English. So um, there was a lot of heartache and there was a lot of pain because we wanted and we had longed for a father that would care for us, a father that would protect us, a father that would be there for us. And everything that we wanted him to be, he was not. He, he belittled us, uh, he yelled at us, he called us names, he shamed us, he blamed us for everything that his kids would do. And so that was just our life. Um, and so there, I began to develop a lot of bitterness towards him. And really, I was really, really angry uh, in many ways at myself that what was wrong with me, that I could literally go through two deaths and neither one of them would even want me. What was wrong with me that all these men in my life would never want to have anything to do with me? I mean, the first, the first boy that I ever liked, he treated me horribly. He called me names. He called me ugly. He called me this. He called me that. And he wanted to have nothing to do with me. And then the second time when I wanted to have a dad, he didn't want to be part of my life. He didn't want to protect me. He never took care of me. He went to work, but I never heard anything good come out of his mouth. Uh, it was always name calling. It was always belittling. It was always threatening. And that was just the, the way that he talked to us. And so when I, when I turned 17, I was very, very, really angry. And I began to listen to heavy, heavy metal music. I began to listen to punk rock. I began to listen to death metal. And I began to hang out with those kind of kids. So I had, I had a little boyfriend uh, that we would just hang out and we would just do that. We would go to places and just listen to all these angry music to just kind of try to get our feelings out. Um, other friends of mine were into other things like um, heavy drugs and other things like that, but I did not feel a desire to do drugs. I just wanted to just forget about the world. So I began to smoke weed um, a little bit here and there first just to experiment because there was some, a lot of peer pressure going on. And then I began to to drink whenever somebody at school would have drinks or would have something available. I would always find that person and I would somehow always end up with alcohol in my possession. So at 17, I began to do that. And then um, a few months later, I turned 18 and I said, okay, this is my ticket out. I left, I moved about 300 miles from where I lived. And when I moved, I basically went into the lion's den. I joined the California Conservation Corps because I was desiring to have a career as a park ranger. And I wanted to work for uh, parks in, 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 in Rec in California. Well, I didn't realize that what I had joined was basically a team challenge kind of program and that everybody that was in the program had either been in jail, had been in juvenile hall, had multiple DUIs, and had a terrible criminal record. I didn't have any of those things. I was just a, a hurt, depressed kid who wanted something out of life. I just wanted to be loved. I just wanted to be accepted. I didn't want to be in trouble. I didn't want those things. But because of the environment that I was in, and because of feeling so rejected for so many years, I ended up um, hanging out with a lot of these people at the center. Instead of keeping to myself like uh, other people did, like other good kids did, I really began hanging with, with the crowd and the crowd began introducing me to, to drugs continuously. So I became completely hooked on uh, pornography, completely hooked on um, marijuana, completely hooked on um, alcohol. Um, I smoked two and three packs of cigarettes a day. Um, by the time I was 19, I was basically drunk on the regular basis. And this is the only life that I knew, but because these people were kind to me, even though I knew I was hurting myself, I stayed there because I preferred having someone than being alone in the dark with my own demons. And it might sound cliche, but it was literally like that, that 
you know, during the day, everything was fine. I was having fun. I had friends. We were doing fun things together or so I thought, even though they were self-destructive, but at night I would just lay in bed and I would just stare in the ceiling and I would just feel so empty and so void inside that I just wanted something more. But I didn't know what that more was. I had grown up in church. Yes, I had gone to church. I had done some worship and different worship things as a teenager, you know, whenever I would, I would sing and the, I would feel the presence of God. But then when the worship service was over, I didn't know how to maintain that feeling. I didn't know how to have a continuous ongoing relationship with God. So I was a Sunday Christian as long as my parents were around. But when my parents were not around, I was rebellious. I, I would do whatever I wanted because I so wanted to have something to cling on to. I so wanted to belong to something. Because my whole life, I had not belonged to anything and no one had wanted me unless I was doing something to make them happy. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as time went on, I just, you know, began to do more and more and more marijuana, more and more and more drinking until I, I lost control and I, I didn't care anymore. I would do it almost during the day where people could almost see me. And then one night I remember not one night, actually, one, one, one weekend, I remember I was walking around with some friends in town because we walked everywhere. None of us had cars, and it was about three miles to the center, from the center to, to the uh, town. And as I was walking around, I remember seeing something on the ground, and it caught my attention. I said, what is that? When I picked it up, it was an ID of a girl who looked a lot like me. Her name was Jennifer Lee, and she was 22 years old. And so I remember my, one of my friends saying to me, hey, that looks like you. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it, it kind of does. Like, well, she's 22. Oh, so? Well, she's legal, so she can go bar hopping. You want to go bar hopping with us tonight? And I almost felt like the cartoon with the bad little angel and the good little angel on the other shoulder. And I just remember sitting there thinking, I probably shouldn't do that. But then the other part of me was thinking, but then if you don't go, what are you going to do? You're just going to stay in your room, staring at the wall, staring at the dark, feeling empty, feeling dejected. Just go. So I went ahead and I went. And um, I remember it was, we got there like at nine o'clock and I, right away I began to drink. And, but I was not used to drinking hard alcohol. I was used to drinking beer and some little strange things called Cisco's. Um, they were like little wine coolers. I was used to drinking that. Well, I began drinking beer and, and cocktails and mixing a bunch of stuff up. And I, I took about six or seven drinks within an hour and a half. And I'm only five foot one. So that was a lot of alcohol in my system. And all of a sudden, I remember I just began to vomit uncontrollably. I couldn't, I couldn't see. I was blacking in and out continuously. So they saw how bad I was and they said, we got to take her home. So they grabbed me and they put me in the back of an El Camino. And then they brought me to the center. And as I was coming in, it was, uh, it was Friday night. So everybody was out smoking. Everybody had just gotten paid. Everybody was hanging around the fireplace and they saw me coming in. And I just remember people just laughing and pointing at me and mocking me because I had recently just been promoted at the job, I had been promoted to a salmon restoration specialist, which was a big deal because it meant that I would get to have my own crew. They would pay me an extra quarter an hour. <laughs> and then I would somehow get a little bit more respect. And then I would also get special um, privileges that the others didn't have because being a salmon restoration specialist, I would now have access to fish and game. I would have more access to all these other organizations that I had wanted to connect with from the very beginning and I had blown it. I literally threw up for hours and I remember uh, that I had this roommate who was a lesbian and she, she looked just like a man. <laughs> but because I had been in a very, very, very bad and abusive relationship, um, she had taken me under her wing and she began to protect me from all the other guys that were trying to make passes at me. And her name was Jeannie, Jeannie Jones, and Lord bless her, she is. And um, 
she found that I was so sick that I could not even hold my head up. So she went with my other roommate and they showered me, they combed my hair, they got me dressed. They turned me over, they had a bowl right there and they stayed up with me all night to make sure I wouldn't choke my vomit and die. They stayed up with me all night long. And it's only because they stayed up with me that I was able to make it that night. And I remember the next morning waking up in a day just trying to figure out what I had done, what had happened. And one of these supervisors coming to me and giving me a paper and I just looked at it and it said Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, what is this? They said, you're going into Alcoholics Anonymous because you have a problem. And I was in denial. I said, I don't have any problems. I drink every once in a while. It's not a big deal. They said, you have a problem. We're going to put you in the rehabilitation center. We can't have you here. It's not safe for you. So I went to my first meeting and I just remember I was the only one there. There was no one else but me and the counselor. And I felt so ashamed. I felt like it was an even bigger black eye on my identity than anything else because I never thought of myself as an alcoholic because my grandfather uh, had become an alcoholic. My grandfather had started as a hardworking man, as the sheriff of town, but his brother had in introduced him to alcohol and as a uh, byproduct of that my grandfather had become a violent drunk so much so that he would threaten to kill my grandmother and my my aunt and my mom they would have to lock him out he would yell and scream he would bang on the doors he would chase them with knives he would threaten to shoot them um he would beat my grandmother and that's who he was and I knew what being an alcoholic was, and I didn't want to be that. So I just remember crying and crying and crying and crying and crying and then receiving a phone call from my mom. And then she said, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? I know there's something going on in your life. And I just confessed everything to her. I told her what had happened, what I had done. Um, and she said to me, the first thing you need to do you need to go to your room and you need to grab everything that you own. Everything that is of darkness, everything that is of punk rock, everything that is evil, metal, dark, grab all that stuff and throw it in the trash. And I remember grabbing literally hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of CDs that were expensive, one of a kind things from the 70s. I remember it was a row about this long, it probably weighed a good 30 pounds, just grabbing the whole thing, sticking it in the bag and throwing it in the trash. And when I did that, I felt something lift. And then my mom said, now go and get yourself some Christian music and I'm gonna send you some CDs. So I, I remember I went out and went shopping, but I didn't know what to buy. So I just came back home and I, I listened to some classical music or something, but a few days later, Two CDs arrived in the mail, and the first CD was Shout to the Lord by Hillsong. And the second CD was By Your Side. And I would just put those headphones on as my roommates were doing drugs or doing whatever, and I just remember it would just be God and me in that moment. And I would just listen to that music for hours and hours and hours, and now we had so much relief. But as soon as I would take off the headphones, it's like I was in another world. Like I was back in hell and everything was dark and everything was evil and I felt that emptiness all over again. And uh, this went on for several weeks and then I just, I felt an urge to go to church. So I, I walked to church one day and I didn't know where to go, but there was this big cathedral and for some reason that cathedral uh, just caught my eye. And I decided I'm going to go inside the cathedral and see what it's about. Well, when I went in, it was a Methodist church. And it was a woman, a woman minister. And I had never seen a woman preach. I had come from a Baptist background. They didn't even know you were allowed to preach the gospel as a woman. I felt like, well, is she even allowed to do this? Is somebody going to sit her down sometime soon? I was a little worried for her. But her message was so powerful. And it touched me in such a way. And she talked about Joseph and how Joseph had been chosen to be Jesus's father and how when we don't always feel like we have a reason and we have a purpose 
and we play the main role, how God can still use us with our gifts, with whatever we are, and then we can still bring him glory, even though we don't realize that at the time that God uses everything. And I remember that brought me so, so much hope. And then I talked to my mom a few days later, and she said to me, I'm getting ready to move. I'm going to go to Florida, and I want to know if you are willing to go with me. And there you will be able to have a fresh start. You can start over. And um, I was ready. So I went, uh, and I went back to the center. I packed everything, and I called somebody and asked them for a ride. I gave them 50 bucks to drive me in, um, 100 miles. And then I stayed with my mom for about two weeks. And while we were there, we were we began going to this Rastafarian church. Uh, for the first time, I heard prophetic words, people giving prophetic words and others receiving prophetic words. And it was completely foreign to me. I had never heard anybody receive a prophetic word. I had never heard anybody pray in the spirit. I had never heard anybody uh, get a prophetic song at the end of a verse. I'm like, what, what verse are they singing now? And they were just breaking out in a new song to the Lord. I'm looking at the transparency and I'm like, I don't, I don't see those lyrics. What, what are they singing? Am I lost? And I'm like, I, I, no, I'm like, okay. So I just went along with it. And that was my, that was my, my introduction to the prophetic was through that Rastafarian church. It was called the Prodigal uh, Project. And it was New Wine, New Wine Church. And it had been a branch of um, the Vineyard Church. So um, we moved to Florida a few weeks later. But when we first moved, we didn't have any jobs. And we were back to square one as if we had gone back to Costa Rica. We didn't have a place to live. We really didn't have uh, any connections. We didn't have jobs. Um, I was not well, um, I wasn't really particularly educated. So I didn't have a lot of money or a, a way to go to the oh, Sorry, My cat just knocked down my camera. I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. So I didn't have, um, you know, a degree and I, I couldn't get a good job. So my, uh, my, uncle worked as a handyman at a super eight motel and they were looking for an extra desk clerk so they ended up hiring me so i was really excited to have the job and everything and i was really super happy to to be doing well and earning my own money but then um there was this older man who was a truck driver and who would come to stay at, at the hotel and um I was very lonely. I was very young. I was 20 years old and he was 40 years old and he began showing interest in me and showing interest in me and showing interest in me. And before long, we ended up having an affair. And I remember uh, the shame of it, the fear of people finding out the, the consequences um, because I had already started going to church. I was part of the worship team, and uh, I just felt like I had failed God in horrible ways. But I was so broken inside that I so desired to have the attention of a man because no man in my whole life had ever shown me any type of positive attention. So the first, you know, little bit of positive attention that I got from a man, I ran after that. And and I remember feeling so broken and so ashamed and so dejected after it happened um, that I just, I would just cry and cry and cry. I just remember sitting at the altar and just crying for hours. And then around the same time, a family member um, began showing me some affection and, and showing me some, some love and some some attention. So I was excited because this man was old enough to be my dad. I was like, oh, great. He wants to be like a dad to me. He's going to disciple me. He's going to be, uh, you know, a, a good person in my life. And uh, I was wrong. Um, he began making passes at me. Uh, he began behaving inappropriately towards me until one day um, I was standing in the kitchen and he reached out to me and he touched me inappropriately. And I remember that I just stood there and he just stared at me and I just felt so vulnerable because I had nowhere else to go. 
I didn't have any other place to live. I was really scared. Um, I was worried that if I told my mom, they were not gonna believe me or they were gonna blame me that it had been something that I have done that somehow I had brought it on. Um, so I just felt so lost and, and, and so afraid. And um, as I was standing there, I remember uh, just feeling horrible. And then I, I went back to my room and I grabbed my clothes and I, I went and showered and changed and it was time for me to go to church. And that morning I was supposed to sing. And um, I got to the church and as people were practicing, we, we got um, done early. So they had a big prayer tower and I just went up to the prayer tower. And I cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. And I said, God, why every time I try to, to get love, affection, why is it that every man in my life has used me, has rejected me, has not wanted me? What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Why did you even create me if all I've created for and good for is to sing to make people happy? And then as soon as they get what they want out of me, they just throw me away like trash. I just remember crying and crying and crying and crying and crying. And then somebody came looking for me because it was time for church to start and we had to do worship. So I went down and, and we started getting ready for worship. And then we sang the normal service and, and we sang everything the normal songs. But when the last song came around, I remember the last verse, something happened. And I felt something at the bottom of my belly that began to rise and to rise and to rise. And then out of my mouth came out a song and a sound that I had never heard before. And I began to sing out this verse about freedom, about God breaking off chains, about God giving you your right identity. And I didn't know what the song was. I didn't have the lyrics to the song. I could not control the words that were coming out of my mouth. They were coming faster than I could even think about them. But everywhere I looked across the congregation, everybody was weeping. Even the worship leader next to me was weeping. Everybody in the band was weeping. And I was weeping as I was singing. But this was the moment that the Lord gave me that psalmist mantle. And that's the moment that I received that. And I remember after service, the, the pastor approached me. He said, what was that? I said, I don't know. Why are you asking me? He said, that was just like harp and bowl from IHOP, uh, International House of Prayer, Kansas City. I said, what is that? He said, that is a ministry that God has given Mike Bickle where they have 24-7 prayer and intercession. They sing just like what you sing. They sing as Holy Spirit gives them a prophetic song, and they release that over the nations that people get healed and all kinds of things happen. I said, oh, wow, that's awesome. So he gave me a CD, and I began listening to it. And I was like, I like this, and I connect with this stuff. So a few weeks later, he reached out to me. He said, hey, Jennifer, every year we send two young people to IHOP uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, to go to the One Thing Young Adults Conference. And everybody who's here has already gone and everything, but the Lord put it on my heart to send you and another girl of 17 named Vanessa. Do you want to go? I said, yeah, I want to go. Uh, I don't have money, though. He said, no, no, no. We'll pay for everything, and we know people there. You even have a place to stay and everything. So I was excited uh, to go, and I wanted to go, but when I went back to the hotel and I told my Indian boss, he said, if you leave, when you come back, you're not going to have a job because I don't give you time off, and you've been working less than a year. If you leave, you're not going to have a job. So I remember standing there thinking, I don't have a house. I don't have a place to live. I'm barely making any money. I was making, like, five dollars and a quarter at the time in 2002 um what's gonna happen but at the same time i could feel the pull from the holy spirit saying go 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 and it's something that i thought about for like two weeks and i would pace the floor and trying to find direction and i could not shake that feeling that i had to go so i approached my my uh my boss and i said to him i have to go he said okay so go so i went and I was so excited to go. We, we had been given a letter to, to hold up to, um, you know, to whoever would find us at the, uh, at the airport and pick us up and say, you know, my Bickle says we can stay and blah, blah, blah. And our pastor is friends with him and, and we have a place to stay. Well, when we got there, we waited and we waited 
and we waited and we waited a good hour and no one came so we called to get directions and we got directions to the center and then we called a taxi when when we called the taxi it was a, a middle eastern man he took the longest possible route he could have possibly taken to well over an hour and by the end of the trip he charged us $75 and he had $150 for the whole week. So with $150, $75 now gone, we have to find a place to eat. We have to find a place to stay and we have to do all these things. So he dropped us off at the center. And when we got to the center, there was a ton of teens and young people there and a lot of staff. And they said, oh, well, where are we supposed to stay? They said, what do you mean? I said, well, where are we staying? They said, we can't stay here. That, well, why not? We were told that somebody would pick us up from the airport, that they would provide us with food, that they would provide us with all these things. They said, no, all the hotels in our city are full. They've been full for months. This is a 10,000 young adult conference. There's no place for you to stay. And I remember looking at the other girl and thinking, you gotta be strong, you gotta be strong. You're 20 years old, you're the adult. She's 17, she's in your care. Don't cry. And I'm over there and my, my tears starting to well up. I'm like, oh, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. You're the adult, you're the mature one. And then all of a sudden this young man comes in, he's maybe 22 and he sees the other girl. <laughs> my mom, this and that. He's like, what's wrong? Why is she crying? I said, well, we told him the story. Somebody was supposed to pick us from the airport. No one ever came. There's no place for us to stay. All the hotels are full. We don't have money for anything. He said, oh, that's not a problem. Let me talk to a couple of people. So he went, talked to some people, and about 15 minutes later, he came back. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. So some of the interns left this morning. Um, and so now we have two bunk beds that are open. And then we also have an apartment that we use for our interns, and we have a food pantry. So how about you stay with our interns in the apartment? You pay me $5 a day. We cover all the food. You can ride back and forth with the girls in the little Geo Metro or whatever it was. And then we just call it good. And we're like, are you serious? Yeah, yeah. So we moved in that night with the girls. We stayed with them. Uh, and they just fed us for free. We paid $5 a day ahead. And we had plenty of food. We had plenty of everything. We began riding back and forth. Well, the second day, or yeah, the second day that we, we went to IHOP, the Lord told um, Mike Bickle, that he was to have the call that Lou Engel does because Lou Engel was there. He says, we're, we're to have tonight a call and one thing together. And as the Lord unites prayer, intercession, and harp and ball, something powerful is going to happen. So I just remember they said, don't eat anything. You fast from morning to evening. And in the evening, the Lord is going to visit you. So I just remember like, What's going to happen, you know? Is it going to be like an angel that's going to like come down from heaven? Or what? Like I had all these things going through my head. I had no clue. <laughs> I didn't know much about the prophetic. I didn't know none of these things, right? So I remember standing there and then all of a sudden, that evening, Mike Bickle starts to call forward people. He said, people that are called to the marketplace, come forward. And I see all these young people getting up and I'm like, what in the world? How do they know? Is this thing great? Like, how do you know what you're called to? How, how are you supposed to know? And then all these people would go forward and they would receive prophetic words and they would weep under the power and they would fall. And I'm like, oh, this is serious. And then he called forward. My favorite, he says, worship leaders and musicians, come forward. I was like, let's go. And I went to go get up and my legs would not. It's like they were cemented to the ground. And I remember fighting with my chair and looking at my friend and said, what's, I can't get up. And she said, why not? And I have no idea. They say, well, what else are you supposed to do? You don't know how to do anything else. I said, I know. Well, I can do it thing. That's all I've ever done. And she said, well, just wait. I'm like, okay, I'll wait. And then all of a sudden he called for, he said, prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, come forward. And something pushed me to my feet. And I said to her, did you push me? She said, no. I'm like, who pushed me? And I looked behind me and there was no one there. Everybody was already up front. So I just looked around and I felt so awkward. I said, I'm not afraid 
Right? I don't even like to talk in front of people. She said, go forward. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going forward. So I got, I went forward and I began to look around the row and all these people were crying, all these people were weeping. And I'm looking and all of a sudden I turn my face and it's like this bright light just shines in front of me. And I begin to see this movie. And this movie begins to play in front of me. And I'm looking at this woman and she looks like she's, you know, maybe in her 40s or something. I remember she had like a, like a women's suit on. She had like a blue blazer and a skirt and blue heels. And she had like shoulder length, dark hair. And she was preaching and she was prophesying. And she was rebuking. And then it's like the angle changed and I could see what she was at. And it was some kind of outdoor crusade. And all the people had dark skin, but they were not African. They looked like either they were either Indian or Pakistani or something. And I remember the, the, the angle turned back to the woman, but I could not see her face because she was moving so fast. And I remember at one moment she turned her face and it was almost like the angle zoomed in and I saw her and it was my face. And I just stood there terrified. I said, no, 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 no. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. My dad was a pastor. I am all too familiar with how they treat people in the ministry. Second, I am not a speaker. I don't like being in front of people. I get shy and terrified. I have to look over people's heads just so I can think because I cannot look anybody in the eye. And I don't, I don't know how to do this. And I just remember arguing with God. No, please don't make me do this. I know my dad, my dad failed. When things get hard in the ministry, I don't want to, I don't want to stand. I don't want to steal. I don't want to do this. And I just keep arguing with God. And then I just remember hearing the voice of the Lord, but you're not going to be like him. And I just wept and wept and wept and wept and wept and wept. And I said, okay, God, whatever you want from me. And I just remember going back and, and, sitting at my feet and then opening up the Bible and then it fell open to Jeremiah and it said this day I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations and I didn't know what that meant I'm like okay I don't know <laughs> what does that look like what does that sound like what I, I don't know what that means he said to root out to plant do not be terrified of their for I will be with you. And I just had such peace. Something settled inside of me as I read that scripture. Then I remember I was just sitting there meditating on that. And then it was time for the next session. And an, an Asian girl gets up and she begins to give her testimony. She was Chan's daughter. And she said, my dad was a pastor. But my dad was involved in ministry. And because of the church and because of the cares of the world, I felt abandoned by my father. And I got into a lot of things I should not have gotten into. And I'm listening to her and I'm thinking, this girl sounds like me. And then she said, but the Lord healed me. And what it took is that I have to forgive my father. And I began to feel that struggle, that inner struggle. I said, what? She said, he doesn't have to be worthy of your forgiveness. You have to honor and forgive your father. When you honor and forgive your father, the Lord will set you free. And I just remember struggling back and forth. Lord, what do I do? Do I forgive him? Do I not? And finally, when I let go, I remember I was so exhausted that I fell forward, hit my face on the cement. And I was out for I don't know how long. But when I got up, the girl that I had come with, she looked at me. She looked said, what happened to your face? I said, what do you mean? I don't feel anything. She's like, you split your eyebrow open. What did you do? I said, I don't know. But I was so full of pride and so full of anger that I literally had to fall on my face and have an encounter like Saul of Tarsus. And that's where the Lord set me free. And um, it's a little bit after 10, so I don't, I don't know what else you, you want me to say. <laughs> Um, but, uh, okay, that was amazing. Um, if you just want to do a, so from then and then a brief from then to now. Okay, um, sure. Happened, so like. from there on, um, I went back to, to my church and, uh, I went back and the first thing I said was repent. 
You're not evangelizing. You're not reaching out to the poor. You are not doing all the things that Jesus told us to do. I just came back from that place and those team people were on fire. They were hungry for the Lord. And you guys have been saved for decades and what do you have to show them? It was bad. <laughs> the whole church turned against me. <laughs> I made enemies with everybody. And I had to leave a few months after that. <laughs> So after I left that church, I went to another church here locally. And those people were actually doing an I have kind of model. Uh, so I began to receive some, some discipleship from them. And they began to introduce me more and more and more to the song of the Lord, more and more to the prophetic. So they, they got me some, some good resources. And then I began to speak in tongues uh, continually. And then the Lord did something uh, to me that I had only seen on TV. <laughs> this is my understanding. This is TV stuff. So I'm one, uh, one time as I was in, in the intercessory meeting, I was part of the intercessory team. I was the youngest one. Um, somebody was in pain or somebody had something going on. I remember I just said, in the name of Jesus. And when I touched my hand on their forehead, they flew 10 feet in the air. and They landed on their back. And everybody turned to me. They said, what did you do to her? I said, I have no idea. They said, how did you do that? I said, I don't know. I've been praying for days and reading the Bible. And everybody just looked at me like I was some kind of alien. So that alienated me even a little more because I was already a little bit strange <laughs> because of all the Jesus things that I had been through. So that put me in an even <laughs> worse category with all the, the other religious folk. But I had to leave that place because I didn't have a car, so I couldn't get back and forth to church. Um, so I just went to different churches for several years until the Lord connected me with an apostolic and prophetic church in 2006. And they released me to, to sing and to, to lead worship. And I began to, uh, to train um, singers in prophetic songs. So I had my own team. I, I led worship on, on Thursdays and on Sundays. And then I was also a cell group leader. Um, I did a lot of evangelism. I did a lot of door to door. So the Lord just began to, to just expand me and grow me and mature me at an exceedingly quick rate. And so I did that for about a year and a half. And as I was working in the church as, as their worship leader, um, I knew that I was getting older. At that point, I was 24. And um, I wanted to be with a godly man, but I didn't want to date anybody in the church uh, because I was in leadership. And I knew that that was a bad thing that didn't work out or something happened or they left. So I began looking for a way. And so I got on a Christian dating website. And I just kind of looked around. I was like, hey, you know, whatever. It's just kind of looking. And then all these 60-year-old men from Texas started sending me messages. And every single one of them, I promise you, they all look like Yosemite Sam. They had these giant mustaches and hats up this ear. They had no hair. But they had a lot of money and they were all interested in me. But I'm like, Lord, I, the devil is a liar. No, my, my husband is out there somewhere. I know he is. You're going to bring him to me. And then this man begins messaging me. And he's really nice. He's really funny. I go and read his bio. And it's, him and I have really a lot of things in common. He's a youth pastor from Indiana. But he has no profile picture. So I'm like, okay, is this a weird guy? What is this? Is this just a lie? Did he just download this and paste it on? Who is he? So I told him, if you want to continue to talk to me, you are going to buy a webcam. And this was during the days of Yahoo Messenger where webcams didn't come attached to your computer. So he went to Best Buy. He bought himself a webcam. And we began chatting on Messenger. So we began chatting back and forth. And I called him for the first time on December uh, 25th on Christmas Day. And we talked for, for a while. And then uh, we continued to talk. And then one night, as we were talking on the phone, I felt led of the Lord to, to turn on Terry McCallman's CD for the bride. So I turned it on, and we just began to pray in tongues and pray in tongues. And before I knew it, I put that thing on repeat seven times. And we prayed all night long. And when I woke up in the morning, I guess I was still half praying in my sleep, half awake. Whenever I would go to sleep, I would wake up and I'd shake my back and everything. And then I, I, I woke up and my hands were covered in oil. 
And I remember hearing, what is this? I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, my hands are covered in oil. So simultaneously, we had the exact same experience 900 miles away. I was here in Jacksonville and he was in Indiana and we had the exact same experience. And the Lord just baptized us with fire um, and with the oil of gladness. We just experienced so much freedom. We just knew, we just knew it's like, this is of God. So we kept talking. And then in January, he decided to come out and meet me in person. So we met in person and, and we knew, we just knew. So he came out one more time to see me. And then the third time he came out, he came out with his dad. We grabbed all my stuff. We put it in the back of the car. <laughs> and I moved to Indiana with them in June of 2007. And then I worked as an intern worship leader at his brother-in-law's church for several weeks. Um, and then we just began uh, working together as youth pastors uh, at an Assemblies of God church. So we got married in November, November 24th to 2007. And then here we are. <laughs> we, we've done a lot of ministry over the years. We've worked as youth pastors, associate pastors, worship leaders, uh, church planners. Uh, the Lord moved us into radio in 2018. We did that for about a year and a half. Uh, simultaneously, I was already doing ministry in Pakistan. I was a uh, leading three different churches and I had three Bible schools uh, that I was teaching and uh, that I was discipling the pastors to to become teachers of the word. So I did that for a season and then the Lord um, shifted our season um, in June of this year and then we began doing television. So now we have a TV program with the Now Network and soon we're going to have a TV program also with Eternal Life. Um, television um and just wherever the lord opens doors we we just we just want to go um and the main message of my heart that the lord has given me is the heart of the father that when you experience the heart of the father everything that is broken in you everything that is orphan in you is made whole when you realize not who you are but whose you are and that is what gives you identity. That is what gives you purpose. That is what gives you value. It's not what you can do. It's not what you have. It's not what you offer. It's who you belong to. And that belonging to him is enough. So, amen. That's amazing. Um, what do we do? So, um, we know you're an amazing singer. Um, and I... I I know we're going a little bit long, but if you wouldn't mind um, just giving us a little taste of your gift. Sure, sure, sure. Here, let me um, find something here. <clears throat> I am a, an oldies kind of person. Um, so the Lord has very specifically told me that he desires for me to, to sing the hymns. Because the hymns that were written... Uh, it's something that people are familiar with, but it's also true of his character. It exalts him. It does not exalt the man. It does not exalt what the man is going through. It exalts the Lord and the Lord alone. So I'm gonna uh, sing, um, I'm gonna sing a hymn. Give me one moment. We're so, sort of a hymn. Thank you, Jesus. Get close. Thank you, Jesus. Get close. Get close. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 
Jennifer, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Wow. 
we've heard you before and uh, I, we've heard you sing in Spanish and sing in English and it doesn't matter what language you, you sing in, it, it touches everyone so deeply. So thank you, mm -hmm. wonderful gift. Thank you for uh, you know, taking the time to go through your, your um, experiences. And um, again, we're very proud of you and glad you're part of our chapter and we're expecting great things going forward. You've already accomplished so much and you should be very proud. Amen. Thank you so much for having me tonight. It's an honor and it's a privilege and I just, I just love that the Lord has connected us all. So this is just a wonderful community and, and I love you all and I know that the Lord has great and mighty things for each one of you. And the thing that I love the most is that he uses everything. Amen. So no matter what you're going through today, the Lord can give you beauty in the place of ashes. And that's the God that we serve. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, anyone.